It was high noon when I made my way from Saika to the ancient well that once belonged to our ancestor Jacob. Most of the women came to draw water in the cool of the day, either in the morning or as twilight sent its shadows across the plains. By coming at midday, I was able to avoid their stares, their ugly gossip. You see, my way of life was public knowledge. The women enjoyed a chance to talk. The well was their meeting place. That day, I recall I felt a greater weariness than ever before. The heat from the cobblestones burned like coals through my sandals. My drab, faded dress was somehow symbolic. My empty soul, my weary spirit. And as I traveled, I thought about how many times I had come to this well to draw water. But that day, I felt a greater weariness than ever before. As I approached the well, I saw a gentle-faced man sitting there. He was deep in thought, meditating. My footsteps broke the silence, and he looked up. He, too, looked very weary. Traveling from Judea to Galilee, a long and tiresome journey. This Samaritan road was not a popular way for Jews to travel, for hatred had long existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. He watched me draw water from the well, and then he spoke and said, Woman, would you give me a drink? <laughs> I was surprised that he spoke to me. And I said, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And he said, Oh, woman, if you knew the gift of God, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I was confused and, and puzzled, and I said, But sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. From whence then comes your living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? And he said, Woman, whosoever shall drink of the water I give will never thirst, for the water I have will become a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And it was then that he made that astounding claim. He said, I who speak to you am he. It was at that very moment that his friends returned. <laughs> They were surprised to see him talking to me. I went back into my village. I told everyone that I saw, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Messiah? Is this not the Christ? And many came and many believed. And that, not because of what I said. They believed because they saw him. They heard him. And they knew. They knew. I was very tired that day. Tired of trying to be what other people wanted me to be, expected me to be. Tired of their disappointment when I refused to masquerade according to the reality. When I saw him sitting there, my first thought was, great. One more man to either ridicule or potentially hurt me. I tried very hard to ignore him. All I wanted was to get my water and leave. 
in peace. I went about my business, pretending he wasn't there, but I could feel him watching me, and I was nervous. He cleared his throat. I ignored him again. He cleared his throat. He cleared it again. All right, I thought. Let's just get this over with. I turned and stared right back at him. He looked straight back at me and smiled. Then he said, woman, would you get me a drink? Wow, he called me woman. Not mocking me, not threatening me, just direct and with absolute respect. Woman, would you get me a drink? It wasn't what I had expected, what I experienced from other men. He saw me for who I was, for who I am. He saw me. He accepted me. I gave him the water. We talked for a while. He said he'd once been a carpenter. I told him I had a workshop of my own. We talked about tools and projects we work on. He told me he learned most of what he knew from his dad. I explained I was mostly self-taught. We both liked the smell of wood chips, the process of seeing something come to being in your hands. Nothing earth shattering, just small talk, like people do when they meet at a common place and realize they have something in common. He was the kindest man I had ever met. That may not seem like much in these times. Kindness changes things. It changed me, my kindness. I trusted myself more after that day. Maybe I trusted people a little bit more. Maybe a little. My way of life was public knowledge, and the public liked to gossip, talk. Behind my back, right in front of me, didn't matter to them. Ugly, painful, vicious, vicious talk. They called me names, said things about me to my family, tried to separate me from my family, tried to turn my friends just because they thought they were right and I was wrong. How can being who you truly are be wrong? And who were they to pass judgment anyway? They sucked the life out of me, left me as dry as bones in the desert. The first thing he this man, this Jesus, said to me was, I'll trade you straight across, friend. You give me a drink of that well water, and I'll give you living water, water that will never dry. Is that so? And just where are you going to get it? You don't even have anything to draw from this well. Where do you plan to li get living water? <laughs> Whatever that is. Don't you worry, little sis, he said. I am living water. <laughs> right, I said, figuring he was just another one of those crazies. You are living water, and I'm the Queen of Sheba. Then he looked in my eyes, and he spoke very slowly. Woman, I am living water. If you drink what I offer you, it will now and forever quench the thirst that, you keep, that keeps you up at night. 
sends you across the desert in the middle of the day in search of a drink. I am living water. And I want you to drink until it's running over and seeping into your shoes. Your life matters to me, he said. And I don't want your bones to dry up. Your life matters to me and to a lot of other people as well. I gave him a full cup. As he took the cup, he touched my hand. And as he did so, I gasped. I felt cool and calm and refreshed and peaceful. I kept catching my breath, long, slow, deep breaths. And I've never felt the same. You may not believe that. You may not believe that one encounter with one man can change a person. But he changed me. They say that he was the Messiah. I don't care if they say he was a man in the moon. I know who he was. I know full well who he was. He was the man who changed me. My life matters. To many. To me. I know this. I know this. Let me be honest, I wasn't really all that surprised when he spoke to me. I'm old now, but I wasn't always old. There was a time when men considered me quite a beauty, a stutter even. <laughs> but men didn't just look at me. They liked to talk with me because I liked to listen to them. I liked to make them laugh but I also knew they needed someone to take them seriously, really hear them. So when the man asked me for drink, I gave it to him. And when I placed the cup in his hand, I said, you look tired, troubled. You look like you could use a listening ear. <laughs> well, he was the one who then looked surprised. He sat for a minute, and then he said to me, and, and not to me, slowly and with concern in his voice, this world is such a beautiful place, but it could be harsh and cruel. I'm sorry about that. I'd hoped for a little more, and he searched for the word, a little more tenderness. I guess I'd hope for a little more understanding. He was so sincere and so disappointed. I hardly knew how to respond. I'm sorry, I said. Is there anything I can do for you? He looked at me held out his glass. Another drink of water, please. Of all the men I've ever known, I remember him the best. I felt like I helped him. I hope I did.
It was one of those days. I got up late after working hard the day before, and it was already hot outside and only going to get hotter. My being hot and moody was only made worse when I discovered there wasn't any water in the jug, which meant I had to take a trip to the well before anything could be done. The road to the well was dusty, the air was dry, the desert sun was scorching, and I was quickly becoming cantankerous. As I drew closer to the well with its precious water, I thought I heard music. But that couldn't be. Music? In the middle of the day? In the middle of nowhere? It's just not possible. Let me say this. Calling what I was hearing music was probably a stretch. So let's go with humming. Humming that was so badly off key, I could not recognize the tune. Fantastic, I thought, becoming tense. Now I'm going to encounter a humming lunatic in the desert. I couldn't turn back since I was desperate for the water and this was the only well for miles around. Sure enough, when I arrived, there sat a man in the shade of the well, bent over, drawing figures in the sand with a stick and half humming. Looking up, he said, woman, could I have some water? Not answering him and not being in the mood to be charming, I said, sir, if you don't mind my saying so, you are singing terribly off key. Startled, he looked up and responded, am not? Oh, but you are, I said. Then he said, with a mad twinkle in his eye, I think you must be mistaken, for I've been known to hold an audience of 5,000 with this voice. Even though I'd arrived in a grouchy mood, I could see that he was teasing me, and I couldn't resist the challenge. You might have charmed them with your message, but it certainly wasn't with your singing voice, because I have perfect pitch, and you are miserably out of tune. According to you and who else, he dared. According to me, and me alone. Then he raised his eyebrows, and with the same twinkle in his eye, looked straight at me and said, Here's an idea. Why don't you go home, get your husband, and bring him right back, and we'll ask him which one of us is right. My mouth dropped open, unable to reply. And at that same moment, we both burst out laughing, because I suddenly knew he was teasing me again. We laughed and talked as if we had been friends forever and could trust each other unconditionally. During our conversation, I had learned that he was waiting for some friends, and when he noticed them in the distance, we said our goodbyes and he stood up, starting towards them, humming as off-key as badly as before. As he met his friends, I overheard one of them say, Someone really needs to teach you how to sing. I laughed, and he must have heard me, because he turned around and gave me a big grin as he walked away. Even though he was tone-deaf as a mule, I liked him. No, it was more than that. I trusted him. I really trusted him, more than I had trusted anyone else in my life. After watching he and his friends disappear into the hot, stifling distance, I stood and filled my jug with water, and after a quick drink, I suddenly burst into tears. Why? Because I realized after all the trust and friendship he had given me, 
I had failed to give my friend the drink of water he had asked for. We all do what we have to do. By all, I mean women. I can't and won't speak for men. We have kids, we feed them, dress them, protect them with our life, drain our blood for them if we must. That's what we do. We work and work and work. When and if life goes our way, we celebrate. When it doesn't, we work harder. We deal with disappointment like it was simply one more job to get done. Do I sound pessimistic to you? I'm not, really, just practical. People can argue religion for hours, but he wasn't looking for an argument. He wanted conversation between equals. He wanted to engage and exchange ideas. I told him my people worship God on the mountain, but his people said Jerusalem was the right place to go to worship. He explained, a new day is coming. And this day is the new day. A new way of worship is ready for you. If you really love God and want him to know your love, let go of all your old ideas, your old ways of doing things. Get out of your head. Just sit, be with him, breathe. Breathe him in. Let him breathe you in, spirit to spirit. Inhale, exhale, you and God. You don't have to impress him. Just be. But what about all the rules and regulations, I asked, the do's and the don'ts, thou shalt's and thou shalt not's, the commandments, the laws. You're going to make a lot of people mad if you toss, toss that stuff out. They are devoted to getting it right. Well said, he answered, and that's the problem. No one can get them all right. And the trying all too often separates you from God. Just breathe, he said. Just be. So we sat there together, breathing, being, breathing, being. In a way, it seemed too simple. In another way, though, it seemed perfectly right, simply right. It was peaceful and incredibly refre refreshing. Until that moment, I hadn't realized how tired I was, how incredibly tired. His words, his ways, fell on me like rain on a dry day. They softened me, restored me, gave me hope. I thanked him for the conversation and watched him walk away. After a few steps, he turned and looked back at me and said in a voice of absolute tenderness, woman, I am sorry about your husband. I was Stunned. You knew my husband? I asked in shock. He smiled, a bright, glorious smile. I knew him well, he said, very well. And I loved him. Me too, I said. I loved him too. Thirsty.
one stoop down and 